Yeah, they'll be hoping it's the breakfast of champions, Phil, as I'm sure those wearing dark blue leaving London this morning will. Best of luck to Chelsea and to Manchester City fans. Now, we learned yesterday that the Prime Minister did not break ministerial rules over the refurbishment work done on his Downing Street flat. However, the report from Lord Guite found Boris Johnson had acted unwisely by... ...friend is moving into the drinks business. So, meet Rocco, who's a Cocker Spaniel, as you can see, the newest member of the staff at uh, William Grant Distillery on the west coast of Scotland. Very excited. Very excited about his work. He's been trained to sniff out impurities in the oak barrels before they're filled. The idea is that, uh, as a result, none of the whiskey will go to waste. Makes a lot of sense. It Rocco does, doing it? A, a very good job, and very as often is the case when they're doing that work, you could see the excitement there. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it absolutely works. Absolutely enjoying it. Um, it's twelve minutes past nine now. This time every Saturday, we check in with two people who help us to understand the latest developments in the pandemic. Joining us now, virologist Dr. Chris Smith and Linda Bold, who's professor of public health at University of Edinburgh. Very good morning to both. Morning. Good morning. Uh, so, uh, Chris, maybe I'm going to start with you this morning, if I may. question a lot of people are asking this morning, we're learning a bit more about this new vaccine. The Janssen vaccine has been approved. Can you just sort of take us through the significance of this vaccine? What's different about it? Uh, this uh, Janssen vaccine, also the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, it's the same thing. This works a bit similar to the way the AstraZeneca vaccine works. It's a modified cold virus called an adenovirus. It's been made so it doesn't grow in the body and cause a threat to health. But what they've done is to use that like a Trojan horse. So it's carrying into the body the genetic message for how to make the outer coat, the spikes that are so crucial to the coronavirus. And the great virtue of this is that you only need to do this once because it produces a very strong stimulus to the immune system and it should be a, a one-off a one -off shot and you'll get a long-term immunity from one, one dose. Linda, do you want to pick up on that? Because uh, one of the significances there, as Chris was saying, single dose. So in terms of how it's used in practice, what difference does that make? Yeah, so this vaccine has a number of advantages. The single dose is a clear advantage. That means, obviously, that we have seen, haven't we, Charlie, a slight drop-off in people coming forward for their second dose for multiple usual pra practical reasons. So, so, so to only have one just makes it much more straightforward. The other advantage this vaccine has is the storage. So it can be stored for a long period at minus 20 degrees Celsius, but for about three months at between 2 and 8 degrees Celsius. So that means we can take it into nursing homes, maybe more rural and remote areas. And as we look ahead, the 20 million doses that the UK government has ordered are not coming down the track immediately. So it may be that they'll be particularly useful for, for example, a booster campaign later in the year. And so, you know, we never knew how many vaccines we would have. It's good news that a fourth one has been approved. But as I say, not quite arriving yet. That'll be in the future. It's interesting that you should mention the numbers there because Peter from Bournemouth has been in touch. Now, 100 million vaccine doses. What's the virtue of purchasing so many? And some people say if they've had to order so many, does that mean the first round won't necessarily be efficient? This is a really tricky topic when we think globally, but just beginning with the UK and indeed a number of other countries, there were so many unknowns at the beginning of this programme that governments really did want to order doses so they could be confident that the vaccines that were coming down the track, if approved, would be available. And we didn't know, did we, which ones would be approved, which ones would fail, um, and the speed of delivery were all unknown. So it was a precautionary step. Um, but now we're in a situation, I was, I was having a look yesterday, actually, at the figures for the EU. You've got 1.6 billion doses they've ordered and 375 million people roughly in the EU. So you can see they're in a similar situation. Looking ahead, the UK is part of COVAX, which is the distribution facility for vaccines. And the UK has committed to giving its surplus doses to other countries. But the mechanism for doing that hasn't yet been worked out. So people are asking, well, if you've still got healthcare workers in the front line, who've not been given a dose and we're now talking about you know potentially in the future vaccinating even teenagers is that equitable and the argument there is it's not so we do need to look ahead play our part globally and protect others not just ourselves uh chris do you want to pick up on the uh, subtype 2 variant of the family of variants from india has actually been documented and, and known to be spreading around the world for a number of months but we began to really notice an uptick in recent weeks. And the thing that really caught people's attention was its ability to spread faster, apparently, on the basis of our initial data, than the strain we already had here in the UK that was dominating hitherto. That was the Kent strain.
is one important issue. The other is you've got to remember that we're actually looking for this. Um, Jenny Harris, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer, said at the press conference on Thursday with Matt Hancock um, that you have to be cautious about the fact that we are actively doing surveillance. We're doing surge testing. We are going out looking for this agent. Therefore, it's unsurprising that we should find more cases of it. So to some extent, the higher numbers are, reflection, are a reflection on us looking for it, but equally, it's a reflection on the fact that it does appear to spread better. But the reassuring message is when people catch it, they don't appear to be more unwell, and we don't have any evidence that the vaccines aren't working extremely well against it. So all in all, it, it's a sort of reassuring message at the moment. There's no evidence, as the Prime Minister said, that we, we're looking at having to change our current roadmap but, you know, you've got to keep an open mind. We've got to, to stay on this and uh, see where it goes. If the number, Because you don't catch coronavirus and instantly turn into a hospital casualty. It takes a while to get the disease, incubate the disease, develop the symptoms, develop severe symptoms, and then come to the attention of, of, of the medical profession. So I guess the next week or so is going to be quite crucial in gathering more of that data, getting a clearer picture on where around the country, because we think it's pretty much accessing all areas, but where around the country it's going and what it's doing longer term and what the general trend is. We think the R number, which people have gone a bit quiet on the R number in recent months, but we think the R number, which is a reflection on how much the epidemic pandemic is growing or shrinking, it's notched up and it's between 1 and 1.1, we think, at the moment. So it has gone up a bit. But then we've changed other things alongside it, such as opening up, you know, the, the, the big opening up a couple of weeks ago when people began to gather indoors again. All these things will also make a contribution. So it's important that we consider all these possible factors and not just blame one possible thing as the cause of this. Lynn so we don't know how long the duration of protection lasts. We're very confident about six months in terms of um, protection. But as Chris and I have discussed before, one of the reasons why the second dose of the vaccine is so important, we've got two thirds of people who've had one dose of that, over that, seven and 10, but just over four and 10 have had a second dose, is because that provides a further longer duration. It, the immune response is more robust and there's longer protection. But we don't yet know for the vaccines we're using at the moment, whether it will be a year or not. Hopefully, yes, there are promising signs, particularly from some of the uh, more preliminary data that we have. Um, I would say, though, that we also have to recognise that the duration of protection may vary between individuals. So typically, older people may not amount such a robust immune response, and therefore they may be the ones who need a booster. Um, but things are going really well at the moment. We should really reassure everyone. And just back to the B1617.2, we do know from that date, those data that were released earlier that the protection from that from the first dose is about a third compared to about a half for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. So it's really important people get their second doses to give them maximum protection. There is increasing pressure of vaccinating. Is How important is it to get young people vaccinated? So we will see a decision on this, I think, in the UK in the coming weeks, because when you see other countries approving these vaccines for younger age groups, Algeria was the first, then Canada being used in the US, Israel, and now Europe and Germany just yesterday said they're going to start vaccinating teenagers in June. So what are the advantages and disadvantages? Briefly, the trial had it for Pfizer-BioNTech had over 2,000 young people in it, 100% effective, actually, and looks like it's safe in those younger age groups. So we don't need to be concerned about safety. That's the first point for that vaccine. But the second point is it may provide more population immunity because we know young, we know teenagers can spread the virus from each other and potentially to others. Uh, but then we still have this question, as we were discussing a moment ago, about kind of equity and availability of the vaccines. And is it a priority to provide vaccines to young people? So we'll have to see what the MHRA decides, and I think they'll be looking at these data in the coming weeks. Chris, I don't know what you've heard about the, um, just on, on the issue of how people react to the vaccines. And We've got to be really careful not to attach significance to a coincidence. Because when you're going into a population of millions of people with an intervention all at once, then it's very easy for a person who was going to have a certain symptom anyway, for that to happen at almost the same time as they have the vaccine. And the way our brains work, the way we've evolved to, to connect cause and effect means that we tend to attach the vaccine as the cause of the thing that just happened. 
So it's very important to keep an open mind. And for that reason, we have a, a tracking system to track side effects. It's called the yellow card system here in the UK. So just with things opening up at the moment, could it be that because we've been separated for so long, if we do pick up a different bug at the moment, things are feeling a lot worse than perhaps they would have pre-pandemic? That is a really good point, actually. So what we're also concerned about in the coming months is there's going to be lots of things which we haven't been exposed to that we're going to be exposed to, to again. You know, other coronaviruses causing the common cold, flu, etc. Um, maybe a tummy bug, things that we're coming into contact with. So as households mix and indoors, perhaps you're, um, you know, visiting friends and family, you're having a meal, you're not wearing a face covering, you might be in an area that's not as well ventilated. We are going to pick up other other bugs, and that means that if people develop symptoms, they may be completely unrelated, as Chris has said, just given the millions of people that are being vaccinated to the vaccine. Um, so keep, keep a watchful eye. If you become very unwell, of course, um, you need to seek advice. But it's likely that, unfortunately, in the coming months, we will be picking up these other things. Um, so we have to keep up the hand hygiene. Um, and while we're asked to do that, obviously, just continue to wear our face coverings. I think you see even more bugs, we expect, in the autumn and winter. Um, as, as is usually the case. Uh, Professor Linda Bold uh, and Dr Chris Smith, lovely as ever to see you. Thank you very Pleasure. much. And really interesting to have that context, isn't it? That it's not necessarily your jab that's made you feel poorly. Because I yes. felt a bit out of sorts for a couple of weeks since mine. I don't like to go on about it, Charlie, as you know. But it's not necessarily the vaccination, is it? It could be all different reasons. Do you want sympathy or, or are we well, I've not on? had any so far, so I've given up. Frankly. Okay. Good. Uh, the weather is nice. Uh, but Louise, what, what, is, what am I talking about? Nice. You might be in an area that's not as well ventilated. We are going to pick up other, other bugs. And that means that if people develop symptoms, they may be completely unrelated, as Chris has said, just given the millions of people that are being vaccinated to the vaccine. Um, so keep, keep a watchful eye. If you become very unwell, of course, um, you need to seek advice. But it's likely that, unfortunately, in the coming months, we will be picking up these other things. Um, so we have to keep up the hand hygiene. Um, and while we're asked to do that, obviously, just continue to wear our face coverings. I think you see even more bugs, we expect, in the autumn and winter, um, as, as is usually the case. Uh, Professor Linda Bold uh, and Dr Chris Smith, lovely as ever to see you. Thank you very Pleasure. much. And really interesting to have that context, isn't it? That it's not necessarily your jab that's made you feel poorly. Because I yes. felt a bit out of sorts for a couple of weeks since mine. I don't like to go on about it, Charlie, as you know. But it's not necessarily the vaccination, is it? It could be all different reasons. Do you want sympathy or, or are we well, moving I've not on? had any so far, so I've given up. Frankly. Okay, good. Uh, the weather is nice. Uh, but Louise, what, what, is, what am I talking about? Nice. It's more than that, isn't <coughs> Gorgeous. it? Gorgeous. I had my second jab uh, yesterday. How are you it, feeling? It's, it's the only symptom I've got is affecting my pointy arm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you've done it's so well. Tender. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sympathy over. No well symptoms done. whatsoever. See you later on. That's what we like to hear for half term. It's 9.30. This is BBC Breakfast. We are on BBC One until 10 o'clock today when Matt takes over in the Saturday kitchen. Morning to you, Matt. Uh, Louise was talking about her, her pointing arm. <laughs> Give me a, you still got that pointy stick. You, had a pointy, you ever got Where's a pointy, pointy stick, stick thing? You still yeah, got it? Our floor manager's just about to chuck it in my head. <laughs> yep, there we go. <laughs> Look, there it is. That could have there gone. It is. That could have yeah, gone. Know, that could have gone really badly. I could have poked our guest in the eye. <laughs> Who's Michael Ball? Morning, oh, Michael. Oh, morning. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. <laughs> I'm really seamless good. links we have. Oh, you're very good at this, Matt. I know. I know. Not really. Uh, now listen, we can talk about your new album in yeah. just a bit. This is the first album you've written. Uh, yeah. It's exciting. Very it's a bit nerve wracking. Yes. Sure. Well, it's out there and it's it's done all right. Yeah. So I'm quite. I'm, I'm, well, we're I'm all here place. to judge it. Thank you. That's <laughs> nice. Well, I'll be judging your food then, won't I? And also, you're back in hairspray. Yeah, we just started rehearsals this Monday. I right. am dying. I'm literally the only exercise I've had for the last however many months is that. Yeah. And, and now you're dancing in high heels. And now I'm dancing in high heels Excellent. and boobs and hair. <laughs> OK. That's what I live okay. for. <laughs> but this is a stage show. Yeah, it's yeah. But, I mean, that's just my Saturday. Oh, it's not a hobby. Uh, right, let's talk about Food Heaven, Food Hell at the end of the show. Yeah. Uh, what's your idea of Food Heaven now? Food Heaven, I've, I'm going for a really lovely seafood and chilli linguine. Yeah. I mean, it's it's perfect combination. Not many people come on and write their own menu. Do they not? <laughs> Sorry. I just want Sorry. this. I mean, you don't, if you don't have to have linguine, but you could use any other kind of pasta. <laughs> I'm go. very easy. <laughs> Hell is the devil's food, mm. Swede. OK. Just the vilest, vilest vegetable right. that... Oh, well, it's a root, isn't it, that's ever been. So please don't... Please, 
please don't give me that. Well, it's not up to me. Two great chefs here as well. Bryn, you're one of them. Good morning. Am I? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing, going to do a, a new season asparagus with morels or banging season, cooked a little bit of Madeira right. and a chopped egg dressing. Really? Yeah. You wore that top last time you were on. Did I? I'm going to yeah. get a change after. <laughs> it's nice, I like so it. Every time I wear something, like you have it. a go. Yeah, Every well, single time. My job. <laughs> Olivia Burt, lovely to have you here. First time on the show. How are you? Yeah, very well, thank you. Good. What have you got for us? Olivia? So I'm going to be cooking butter roasted halibut with courgettes cooked in lemon verbena and a chicken butter sauce. Nice. Mm -hmm. Like the sound of that? Yeah, I love the sound yeah. of anything. Yeah. Here's Excellent. our wine girl, Helen McGinn. How's Hi. you, Hel? <laughs> I'm very well, thank you, Matt. I like that. <laughs> OK. There's a joke there somewhere for somebody <laughs> funnier than me. Uh, as usual, what Michael gets to eat at the end of the show is down to you guys at home, so go to the website for voting details, and we'll see you at 10. I think Michael Ball just said, I'll eat anything. Didn't he just say, I'll eat anything? <laughs> apart, from Swede. Swede. apart from Swede. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right, anything apart from Swede. There we go. Now we know. Fancy Swede being the line that you draw. Well, you need to talk to Michael Ball about that. He's just laid it out there. It's pretty isn't it? Well, I will next time I see him. I'll cook him in Swede nicely. We've got the sport coming up in a few minutes' time. You've accepted artificial intelligence. A panorama special. And Charlie State. Hello, you're watching Breakfast with Nina Warhurst and Charlie State. Let's check in with Mike ahead of the Champions League final. Good morning. I can almost touch it. Oh, All 73 it's within and a half your reach. centimetres tall. The holy grail of European club football, isn't it? Human. A panorama special layer.